Hi, my name is Kathleen Richardson and welcome to the Feminist Ethical Dialogues. Uh, today we are going to be talking about deep fakes and VR pornography with Genevieve Gluck and who, who uh, we've had previously on as a guest who does extraordinary work with women's voices. She's a feminist, uh, writer and campaigner, and she's also uh, has a view to write a book on this topic, and I think she definitely should. Um, and just to remind you that the campaign against porn robots, we we look at new technologies and uh, and the, the way in which new technologies are harming women and girls. So these are these feminist ethical dialogues are looking at the ways in which different technologies are impacting on women and girls. And before I hand over to Genevieve, I just wanted to say um, that you've actually change something in the world because as a result of an article that Genevieve wrote on 4W, for women, uh, which I recommend everybody check out, app fetishizing forcible transitioning of kids available on Google Play. Unfortunately, this app is still on it, but it, it uh, features pornographic pedophilic imagery about forced transitioning of children uh, into trans children and actually it had a number of like uh, vignette stories as part of the, the the app and one of the stories featured Molly Russell who was a schoolgirl who committed suicide um, when she was exposed to self-harm harm images online and uh, as a result of reading Genevieve's article I contacted the solicitors that represent uh, Molly Russell's family and they contacted me and told me you know they were very pleased with, that we brought them the matter to their attention but they also have now had her image removed um, as I said unfortunately the app's not removed but at least her image has been removed that's a step so that's really thanks to your work Genevieve so well done you've actually done something now something else that might interest our our viewers is the solicitors also said if they know of anybody who this happens to again so if you find that your image or your child's image is being reproduced on a porn site or, or is being represented in a porn doll uh, let us know and i can put you in touch with the lawyers and they can see whether there's any uh, form of legal redress so without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand over to you. And I'll turn off my camera while you're talking. And uh, when you finish your presentation, we'll have a dialogue at the end. So over to you, Genevieve. Well, thank you so much for having me, Kathleen. Um, as you said, today I'm going to be talking about deepfakes and VR pornography. And I'm going to share my screen now. So I have a presentation. Just a brief presentation for you. Okay, so we're going to start by looking at deep fakes and what they are. So to begin with deep fakes, it is a portmanteau of the terms deep learning and fake. Uh, this originated on Reddit in 2016 or 2017. It was first reported in 2017 by Vice and the user was called the deep fake. And this Reddit user was taking images of celebrities and uploading them into video pornography. So this was a shift from what had been done in the past where it was Photoshopped images. This was actual video content. And he targeted many high profile female celebrities including Scarlett Johansson, um, Gal Gadot, um, many others as well. And the technology that this person used, this anonymous person who, by the way, whose account has been removed, um, is now increasingly being replicated and used against women who are not major public figures. It's being extended from not only the A-list celebrities, but down to influencers, even down to uh, just regular women in the public sphere. So this is an example of one of the videos that was posted by the user deepfakes on reddit in 2017. This is a clip obviously not the full video and you can see that 
you know, despite its glitchiness, it's very realistic. And this was five years ago as well. So bear in mind that the quality has only improved exponentially. So there's a research group called Sensity AI, which has been documenting and studying this phenomenon of deep fakes. They found that between 90 to 95% of all online deep fake videos are non-consensual porn. And that means all of it is porn um, because it's all non-consensual. So basically the vast majority of deep fake video content online currently is of pornography and overwhelmingly of women. This number 90% comes from a recent study, I believe October last year. However, prior to that in 2019 and 2018, the numbers are different starting at around 99% of all of these videos being of women specifically. Um, we can see that as the technology is developing, that number is shifting a little bit, but it still remains overwhelmingly uh, content targeting uh, women as victims. Um, another statistic which I neglected to put here is that a lot of these women are Korean celebrities, so K-pop idols as well. They represent a vast amount of the victims. So as the technology has advanced, there are numerous easy to use and no code tools. By that, I mean things like applications which have emerged, allowing users to strip the clothes off female bodies and images. Many of these services have since been forced offline, but the code still exists in open source repositories and has continued to resurface in new forms. The latest such site received over 6.7 million visits in August, according to researcher Genevieve O, oh, who discovered it and has yet to be taken offline. So data encrypted apps are used to share these types of content, um, revenge porn, deep fakes as well. Um, Telegram is one of the most popular apps for distributing deep fakes as well as requesting. So users might join one of these channels and also re make requests for what they wanna see. The same goes with Discord as well. There are Discord servers and I'm sure many yet to be discovered, which, um, proliferate this content. There has been one prominent example that has been discovered, but due to the private nature of Discord, these are difficult to track. Um, and as I mentioned, users in these groups can request custom made pornography from photos. And actually in 2019, end of 2019, Samsung developed the technology to make videos from a single photograph rather than using video of a person, whereas in the past celebrities were used because there was video content of them. Nowadays, a single photo can be used to make a video. So for example, in October of last year, it was reported that a Telegram app, uh, sorry, the Telegram bot was being used to undress underage girls. Um, it's since been taken down but Sensity AI investigated and discovered what they called a newly uncovered deep fake ecosystem emerging on Telegram. And this channel used a, a bot. So to strip an image, users uploaded a photo of a target and then the bot would automatically um, make the person nude or resemble a nude figure. So as a result of this Telegram bot, approximately 104,000 women were targeted and had their personal images stripped nude and shared publicly as of the end of July, 2020. The number of these images grew by 198% over the course of three months. Self-reporting by the bots users indicated that 70% of the targets were private individuals whose photos were taken from social media or private material. So this is a fundamental shift in who the victims are starting to be. A limited number of bot generated images shared publicly across affiliated channels featured targets who appeared to be minors under age. 
the bot and its channels attracted over 100,000 members worldwide, with 70% of the membership base coming from Russia and in that surrounding area. The bot received significant advertising on Russian social media. Further research shows that up to a thousand deep fake porn videos were uploaded to popular porn sites for each month of 2020. The videos are incredibly popular and receive millions of views. For example, a 30 second clip of Emma Watson gained over 23 million views. And video content from TikTok has begun appearing on porn sites. And bear in mind that nearly a third of TikTok users are minors. Many are under the age of 14. In 2020, a Rolling Stone investigation revealed instances of TikTok influencers having their likeness stolen and uploaded to Pornhub. A Discord server, which I've mentioned before, was found to be dedicated to creating deep fakes, including of minors. One of the commenters said, do her, she turns 18 in four days. So recently, in this month, a Taiwanese YouTuber was arrested for selling deepfake pornography of female influencers through Telegram. Zhao Yu netted almost $500,000 from the sale of this content, and among his victims were three female politicians who are now calling for laws to be implemented to protect against this type of exploitation. Last month in September, a sextortion scam in India was found to be using deep fake pornography to target men, which is a strange development, um, different from the current trend. And it appeared as though women were calling to engage in adult activity. And then the fraudsters would record the men um, in a sexual context and then blackmail them uh, by saying, you know, we will upload this con content online. Uh, this is very common with this type of activity to blackmail, threaten, coerce, and then demand money uh, in order to protect your privacy. Uh, last year in October, Tokyo police arrested men, two men for producing deep fake porn using the faces of female celebrities. Interestingly, the men were charged with defamation and copyright infringement. So the court found that the men were violating the copyrights of the pornography company. So the company that owned the image of the bodies, but also the copyright of the celebrities um, parent company. So their agents and their contractors who were then said to in effect kind of own the reputation and likeness of the women's face. So in each case, you have two different companies sort of claiming a copyright to the representation of these women. And not yet has it been um, acknowledged that this was a, an attack on the women themselves. Um, recently in Myanmar, uh, in February, there was a military coup and the people of Myanmar have been protesting against this sense at great cost to themselves. Um, the protests have been led largely by women because women had past experience with organizing for labor rights. Um, women represent a large portion of the garment industry in, in Myanmar. And what's happening now is that the women protesters, especially leaders of the protest movement, are being targeted for deep fake pornography. Um, their faces and likenesses are being manipulated into pornography and shared online. Also recently, the Revenge Porn Helpline, funded by the UK government, received a case from a teacher who lost her job after deep fake pornographic images of her were circulated on social media and then brought to the school's attention. Uh, I just wanna point out here something that I've, I've said before, I wanna keep saying is that if pornography was truly empowering for women, there would be no concept of deep fake or revenge pornography. 
The intent of this pornography is to punish, shame, humiliate, and degrade. If pornography was not inherently degrading, then this concept could not exist. I want to point that out because there is somewhat of a movement now to relabel what's called revenge porn. Some people say that this stigmatizes pornography to put the word revenge in front of it or impl imply that it's you know, affiliated with criminal activity. And I strongly oppose that because the nature of pornography is to degrade and harm women and men are aware of that. And that's why they're able to weaponize it. So I'm introducing now Noelle Martin, who was targeted by a deep fake porn campaign. And she has this wonderful TED talk that she gave um, in Perth, uh, where she talks about this and it's really, really powerful. She doesn't mince her words at all. I really recommend it. Um, this is a quote from her. This kind of abuse where people misrepresent your identity, name, reputation, and alter it in such violating ways shatters you to the core. To this day, I've never been successful fully in getting any of the images taken down forever that will be out there, no matter what I do. Um, I want to point out here, she has had some success now, but she had been pursuing this herself for years. Uh, if you watch her TED talk, she explains the incredible traumatizing effect this had on her and the amount of work that she had to do herself, largely without help, uh, to get some of these images of her removed. Since her TED Talk, Martin has completed her law degree in Australia and is working towards being admitted as a lawyer. So she hopes to use her law degree to fight for justice for victims and survivors of image-based abuse, abuse and deep fakes. Her goal is to hold perpetrators and tech companies who fail to take adequate action to combat this abuse to account. Here we have another prominent victim turned activist, Helen Mort. Helen Mort was the victim of a fake pornography campaign, but what's really shocking about her case is that the images were based on photos that had been taken from her private social media accounts. So things like where it's set to friends only and including a Facebook profile that she had actually deleted. The perpetrator had uploaded these non-intimate images like for example, holiday and pregnancy photos and even pictures of her as a, as a girl, as a teenager, and encouraged other users to edit her face into violent pornographic photos. Um, Helen Mort says, it really makes you feel powerless, like you're being put in your place. Punished for being a woman with a public voice of any kind. That's the best way I can describe it. It's saying, look, we can always do this to you. Another woman who's fighting for changing laws uh, to protect against this kind of abuse is Danielle Citron, who is a legal scholar. And she wrote a book in 2014 about this topic called Hate Crimes in Cyberspace. When you see a deep fake sex video of yourself, it feels viscerate, viscerally like it's your body. It's an appropriation of your sexual identity. It feels like a terrible autonomy and body violation. Um, the laws are not yet catching up with the technology. Uh, that's a real concern of mine. The fact that the technology is advancing so rapidly and many countries don't even have laws to protect against this, no legal recourse for victims. And uh, as I mentioned, the Taiwanese YouTuber earlier who was arrested even, you know, for making deep fake uh, pornography of politicians, he was released on bail. So he's not currently in prison. So while he's awaiting trial, he's been released. It's, it's just really not taken seriously by many lawmakers currently with very little exception. Fortunately, uh, along with these other brave women, there has been more pushback. Uh, for example, a Chinese woman recently who uses the alias Tisiphone, I think I pronounced that right, um, a Greek goddess of vengeance, 
discovered a video of herself had been uploaded on Pornhub without her knowledge and has founded an app for victims of non-consensual pornography. So she found the video of herself after a friend told her about it and is now working with a team to create this AI-based app and it's called Electo AI. So again, named after a Greek goddess of fury. And this is the logo, Electo, which is I think currently in development. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna switch over to talk about VR pornography. Uh, there's limited research about this currently. So I'm going to be sharing a bit of information, um, a little bit of background first. So to begin with Pornhub, created the VR video category in 2016. One of the things that shocked me when I was looking into this issue is that this is already here. I had thought VR pornography was something that would be coming this year or next year possibly, but it's already here and it's already happening. Um, and it's been happening since at least 2016. Uh, currently pornography is the only sector of VR are that's turning a profit for investors. We find uh, commonly we can see this theme that pornography and the exploitation of women is a mirror for driving technology. Um, for example, Moscow-based startup, um, I do not know how to pronounce that, V-R-A-Y-U, um, sells and rents VR headsets with porn preloaded onto them. There are also VR porn cafes uh, and arcades that are starting to appear. Um, the industry is predicted to be worth $26 billion in the next five years. Important to notice that not all VR porn is artificial. So uh, meaning CGI or pixels or so on. Um, for example, Dreamcam is one company that's specializing in video content. The immersive nature of this media suggests that it will likely be far more addictive than 2D pornography. Uh, Facebook recently launched Oculus, the VR headset, um, for I believe it's as cheap now as $300, which used to be sort of priced above the mainstream market, but now it's getting cheaper and cheaper. And this technology is developing rapidly. And also this type of pornography is customizable. So it can be based on a photo or you can use AI to build a woman to your specifications. And here's an image um, on the left here, I have an image of something that is used for VR pornography. Um, maybe I should have mentioned earlier that I need to use a little bit of adult language here. Uh, so this, as you could probably imagine, is for men and it's used to pleasure men who are watching VR pornography. Um, in slang, not in technical terms, in slang it's referred to as a cock sleeve um, and it has inside of it uh, vibrating, um, vibrating technology. Currently in development, we have tactile ultrasound, which is conducted through these small speakers um, that cause waves in the air and give the sense of touch. This is not yet quite on the market, but it's predicted to be soon. Here's an example of a possible interface from one of these companies that provides this technology. Um, so you have basically this menu here where you can pick the video that you want uh, and then set your vibration level down here and so on. Not difficult to imagine um, how quickly this could become addictive for some people. So the research that we have shows that currently men are much, much more likely to watch VR pornography content than women, 160% more likely, and particularly the age group 25 to 34 
is more likely to watch um, VR porn compared with all other age groups. Uh, recently, a study was published in the Journal of Sex Research titled VR Porn as an Empathy Machine. Um, so I took a look at this and while, while I'm not opposed to VR in general as a technology, and I do believe it can have some beneficial effects, especially for invoking empathy, in my opinion, it's quite a stretch to say that VR porn can instill and develop a sense of empathy, especially when you have men using this who are able to do whatever they like, right? So just completely remove the element of consent from any of this. They're whatever they want, they can have, and it, it will actually impact the brain. Um, I, I don't need to get into all of the research about the pornography, but it's been shown for decades that it has an impact on the brain and triggers mirror neurons. So in my opinion, in effect, this could actually train men to have less empathy for women and to objectify them further. Um, notably, the this study only asked men what they thought of the pornography, and they said things like it made them feel more desired, made them feel more attractive, uh, it was more immersive, they preferred it to 2D pornography, of course, of course they would say so. But when I was looking at the authors of this study, I did notice, interestingly, that all of them have co-authored other research that has to do with trans activism and queer theory. One of them in particular did research on paraphilias involving age regression. So I always try to take the moment when I can to point out the overlap between gender ideology and pornography, which um, I just think can't be overstated. So uh, at the time of this recording, just within the last 24 hours, Facebook has announced that they've changed their brand name. So their company name has been changed to Meta, although this won't affect um, how we refer to Facebook. It's a symbolic gesture, but this is because Facebook has become heavily interested in the creation of an artificial universe using the Oculus VR. And they call this artificial universe, the metaverse. Uh, meta is I think Greek for beyond. Interactive pornography is only one aspect of an emerging digital replication of reality. It's reasonable to assume that there will be massive multiplayer games where one can go to to quote unquote have sex with another avatar using various devices. And I want to detail, uh, in my view, what some of the harms to women are here, and then I'll leave it open for discussion with you later, Kathleen. But I have here a quote from Tracy Cox, who has commented on VR pornography. Uh, she's actually in favor of it. So I find it interesting, this quote that says, some men ask for avatars of their girlfriend or wife because they can make them do something they won't do in real life. Um, also, it doesn't even have to be a woman that a man knows. It could be any woman that he picks uh, that he could make them do something that they don't want to do. And I'm bringing this up because voyeur porn, spy cam porn is just increasing exponentially and the victims are often unaware that this is happening to them. Recently, last year, three male judges in Tennessee said it was okay to film women in public without their consent, which was really shocking I, and largely uncommented upon in the mainstream media. Um, there was a man who was following a woman around in a, in a shopping mall, taking video of her. And when asked about it, he said that it was his intent to use it for pornographic reasons. And yet this was found to be okay, um, not criminal behavior in the opinions of these judges who justified their opinion, their decision by basically insinuating that women could do it as well. 
uh, they said something along the lines of now that everyone has a phone, she can record in public also something like this, which implied that women would be doing this when we know that that's really not what's happening here. And similarly, um, just last month uh, in September, uh, Tokyo rolled, this is from Japan, that it was also all right to take voyeurism shots of women in public so long as she was wearing pants. So if she's wearing a skirt, not acceptable. If she's wearing pants, that's fine. And again, this was a man who admitted to wanting to use this material for pornographic purposes, taking a photo of a, of a woman's um, rear while she was in public without her consent. So among the many harms to women, to start with creating a likeness of any woman, this means that any woman out in public anywhere or showing a photograph of herself online as a potential target, um, this would mean that we would have no expectation to privacy and bodily autonomy. We would just expect to be exploited against our will anytime that we show our face anywhere in public or online. Um, it would drastically harm women's ability to be in the public sphere and to speak up. Already women are hounded across social media and sexually harassed. I mean, this would just make it so much worse. Um, as well as the possible increased addiction would lead to increased violence against women. Um, people often contest this correlation, but there's decades of research to back up the findings that pornography use, yes, does increased sexist attitudes towards women and violence against women. I just recently in India saw a case of a, a couple of boys, 11-year-old uh, boys who were watching pornography and then um, tried to uh, force a six-year-old girl to act these out with them. And when she refused, they, um, they killed her. So we have to consider also the element of children who are being exposed to this type of thing. Um, there's also the possibility of the sale of someone's likeness as intellectual property. Will we now begin to copyright ourselves and sell ourselves? There's also the element of blackmail, coercion, threatening, um, taking a photograph of a girl from social media, threatening her to, for example, to have sex, um, and saying that you would upload these photos online with, if she did not. And then there's the element which has been largely unexplored, which is what will happen after someone dies to the images of them online. So your right to your own likeness can only last as long as you are alive to claim it. But if you are not alive to claim or to fight back, what will happen to your image then? And will it be free for anyone to use? I have here an example of this, um, which happened recently. I believe this was in 2019, 2018, 2019. Um, Lauren McCluskey, so she was a university student in the state of Utah. She was shot and killed by a man that she had been dating who was blackmailing her with revenge porn. And by the way, this man that she was dating was a registered sex offender, but he hid this from her by changing his identity. So again, we can see here that changing someone's legal name and legal status and legal identity grants control and power to sexual predators. Um, after she died, the police officers who were involved in her case shared the photos amongst themselves. And one of them had commented um, saying how, how delighted he was that he could see her naked anytime he wanted to. This actually resulted in a change to the law in the state of Utah, uh, which would allow legal recourse for, for the deceased and for family members of the deceased in this case. Um, which needs to be addressed and talked about more um, everywhere. 
So with all of these emerging technologies, there's a what I would call a combined threat, which is the spy cam pornography. So the ability to take a photo of anyone anywhere in public, then the emerging technology of taking a single photograph to make a video, um, as well as the deep fakes, the VR pornography, all of these are connected and feed off of each other. And it's my opinion that this kind of technology poses a fundamental question about women's right to our own likenesses, our own resemblance, and not only ourselves as individuals, but as a class of women. So as we can see that most of the deep fake porn is of women, and most of the people doing this are men who are making incredible profits from doing so. So they are making profit from the likeness of women. Do women as a class have a right to claim our own likeness? I believe so. And I believe that we need to start addressing this problem because it's not only the pornography, it's the very fact that our identity is being claimed now by some men. Do we not have the right to say no that our image belongs to us, our identity is ours, and it's not for sale. I really think that that's a fundamental issue we need to start being more vocal about. And I just wanted to end here with this, um, I hope, um, empowering and uplifting photo of women in South Korea protesting against spy cam pornography. It was one of the largest protests uh, in recent years and was women only. So they, they managed to have, I think in the tens of thousands of women in Seoul um, and, they, and they, they, deliberately, <laughs> they deliberately kicked out the men <laughs> and it was only women. Um, well, I laugh, but actually the issue of spy cam pornography in Korea is quite serious and they've developed task forces and laws to address the problem. Um, but it continues on. And as you may know, Korea is home to Samsung and Samsung is the company that's responsible now for the technology which allows video to be created from a single image. Okay, that's all from me. So I'll open Thanks. it up now if you wanna talk, talk about some of the impacts on women. Yeah, well, thank you very much for that. That was extraordinary, as usual, um, from you. Amazing presentation. And uh, you've raised so many important issues. I just don't know where to start. One of the, one of the things I just want to say is I'm really pleased that you that you bring in the global perspective. You show, you know, that it's not just North, you don't prioritize um, one section of the world like North America, but you're actually demonstrating how global this phenomena is, how it's affecting women in all corners of the world. And, um, and for different reasons, some because they engage in political protests, um, while others, um, you know, from countries like that are producing the technology. So I think that's really important that, in fact, in all the presentations that we do, we try to bring in this global perspective to include other women. So I, I guess um, what, what links all these technologies together is pornography. So I think the first thing we've got to do is really establish what pornography is. Um, how do we see pornography? Um, and I think once we've done that, we can then discuss what I think is um, where, where I think these technologies, imagine all the things that could be created, these technologies are created. So there's something about um, an aberration, I would say, in masculinity, in male sexuality, an aberration that is, is, is actually producing um, all this horror in the world. Uh, so, what what would you say pornography is? I know you used a kind of definition earlier, but if you could just recap what you think it is. Well, fundamentally, it's the depiction of, of sexual acts, although I think that's how laws tend to define it, but um, there's some speculation that things, you know, like statues in the past, uh, Greek statues and so on, were actually 
intended as a type of pornography depicting nude women, like, you know, like the Venus de Milo, uh, things like this. So it depends on, it depends on the definition, but I guess what I want to say is there's this tendency among people who support pornography to say that it's always existed and it always will exist. And yet for me, there's no comparison between the Venus de Milo and what's happening on Pornhub where you have women being bound, gagged and choked. I mean, so to say that pornography always existed ignores the fact that this technology hasn't always existed and that it wasn't always real women who were being harmed. So I would put my focus on the fact of recorded um, using women, real women's bodies. And then I, that also makes me question, you know, now about like fake pornography or animated pornography. Um, for example, in Japan, child sexual abuse is still legal if it's animated because they're not involved in it, but we know that it still shapes attitudes towards children. I don't know if I really answered your question though, yeah. like directly I, the way that you wanted, but. Yeah, well, I think we can keep coming back to this question because, I, you know, we live in a world where porn now is shaping our, I think porn is a, is a form of politics and the politics that it articulates is male dominance and female subordination. You know, pornography is a graphic subordination of women primarily, but also girls, uh, children, you know, I mean, boys as well, also animals. And the kind of depiction of it can take, takes place uh, against women and girls and animals and boys but it also can take place uh, as representations, if you like, of that abuse that takes place. And I guess what is, um, I do not see pornography as related to sex or sexuality at all. I see it as a, it's like, a, it's a tool to kind of assert male dominance. It allows men to feel powerful in the world. I guess many men, you know, the fact that it's so ubiquitous and it's so common now uh, strikes me that men, it's, it might be the only source of power they actually have in their lives, you know, that they, they lack so much power in their lives that unless they feel like they're seeing somebody subordinated, a woman being subordinated and can act out some kind of harm on, a, on someone, that they, that they are not deriving any sense of power. And they're obviously that's connected with their how they uh, orgasm, and so what that you know that kind of idea is being just copied and reproduced in these technological forms. And what was interesting about your presentation as well was that there's a there seems to be a growing number of men now who are unable to find intimate partnerships you know they're not forming relationships with women this is a big problem in Japan and other countries in the world uh, but also it's happening in North America with the incels so you've got this growing population of adult and early adult men who are not engaging in relationships who are themselves immersed in these online forums and online environments who them who are kind of either using the apps or developing them um, and the technologies and then you've got men now who are viewing all this stuff and in interacting with human beings in their life women they have girlfriends or wives and they may have children and they're viewing all this stuff um, and I'm just thinking about the risk now that a woman takes when she's in a relationship with a man who views pornography she's actually at a, an existential risk from that engagement that involvement um, so I guess I guess that's how I'd start to make the connections with these different types of technologies and what I mean, I want to look at it from a number of angles, but let's just let's just look at it from the men who are um, not in relationships. You know, the kind of report that you said about the empathy men were getting, uh, men are men are kind of 
feeling more empathy from that, from using these uh, devices, the VR porn. So let's just go with that empathy. How is that possible that they're going to have an empathetic response with something that's not real, where there's some graphic abuse taking place? It's extraordinary, right? <laughs> It, it, I, I struggle to even find the words for that. It, it's so, I mean, it's beyond the pale. Like, how can you have empathy for, for something that's not real? Um, they also were talking about how the eye contact was really important. So they compared it with like the mainstream, the 2D pornography. And they would say, you know, when I use this, I don't have eye contact Um but when I use the VR, then I can make eye contact, um, which they, which the study suggested made them more empathetic. But it's not eye contact. It's not. There's no one there. Yeah. It's, it's startling that even in the report itself, it doesn't seem to acknowledge that this isn't real. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it'd be like saying that you're... You know, if you looked at a photograph in a gallery, an art gallery, and the photograph had an image of a person who happened to have a face, and you looked at the face, you were looking in somebody's eyes. Um, I guess they flicker around on a 3D virtual things, but but that's um, that strikes me more as elaborated puppetry than uh, it, it doesn't change the, I guess, the ontological uh, experience, does it? It's not suddenly having moving pupils or dilating pupils in a, an animation does not somehow. Yeah, it's quite concerning. I mean, there are, there's, a, I was reading recently someone who says, terms are used quite a lot. You know, you can use the term empathy, you can use, the, you can use other terms, but they actually, the meanings are so, um, we're, we're, we're losing some of the meanings of these words. They don't, they're stopping to mean the things that they used to mean. So empathy used to be about how people would respond to each other, to kind of, it's about acknowledging what another human being might be thinking and feeling and responding appropriately to them. And it's just like these words are being colonized and then applied to how men are using pornography in virtual environments. It's, but you picked up a good point about the, the queer, queer theory and gender ideology and its connections with porn. Perhaps you could elaborate on that a bit more because I think that's a really important connection. Um, before I do, I just wanted to make a comment there about the empathy, um, which is that I, okay, I find it interesting that VR technology is being used in this way. So for example, there was a VR video that was shown at the UN a couple of years back that was designed to promote empathy, uh, to put the politicians into the shoes of someone in Syria, in war-torn Syria. So that it was designed to make you feel as if you were a person who was suffering the same experience. Um, so that's a known benefit or feature purported to be, right? Mm. However, the negative aspect is said to not exist, that it could then train you to not have empathy is something that's being said not to exist. And more than that, this research is getting ahead of the curve to kind of insist that it does. So I, I actually think it's a little bit sneaky. It's a little bit political, but yeah. So the, the researchers were all from the, um, I wanna get this right, the University Medical Center of Hamburg in Germany. Yeah. Um, Right. I've been following, so Germany, right? Yeah, I've been I've been following a lot, I've been following a lot of, of uh, the the VR stuff and about therapy, how it can be used therapeutically for for certain things like this with, with empathy. So in in one example that that was um, shown, it was a father who was violent towards his children, but he, but in the VR version of the experience he was um, in the role of a little child and 
and someone was shouting at him. So he got a sense of how scary it must be to be a child in that situation with him being a grown man and being angry towards his child. But I don't think you need VR for that, right? You could just have a like um, a, a theater set up. You could, you could role play in real life. You don't need to have these expensive technologies in order to have that effect. Uh, I mean, you could have some effect, but um, I think ultimately- well, I kind of feel, I kind of feel like what seems to be happening in a sense is that this porn or this um, technology is driven by the pornography, so they have to find a way to justify it. Yeah, um, I, f I, I feel like that's what's happening. Like they're saying, well, there's a lot of money to be made here. And by they, I'm just using it loosely. Generally, I don't I don't mean anyone in particular. But in general, there's so much money to be made. We need to pursue this profit, this technology. Um, how can we justify it to the general public? OK, we'll 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 do it like this. We'll say it promotes empathy. We'll say that it can be used as a teaching tool. All of those things may in fact be true and may be possible to achieve, but that's not the reason. And the, the driving motivator for this has been to basically undress women, to grant men sexual access to women. Why are we pretending that that's not the case? Yeah, no, and I absolutely, I mean, I was astounded by some of the figures you presented there. So in the news, you know, if you followed the news over the last five years about deep fakes, you'd think it was all like, you know, a conspiracy, a political conspiracy. And what I what I recognize from your presentation is that the vast majority of it, I mean, over 90% of it, I know that some of the figures are shifting into other domains, but it's pornography. And I looked at another statistic and it was like a hundred percent of the pornography is of women. Um, and like you, I mean, you made another very good point about, yes, it was actresses, but um, because there was a lot of video footage, in order to create a deep fake, you needed to have video footage so you could record the expressions and the movements. But now you can use it from an image so that now it's a tool. It becomes like what these technologies are, are like terrorism against women, aren't they? They become tools of terrorism against ordinary absolutely. women. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, looking looking at this kind of research and stuff, I actually, um, I, I was out exercising. I was going for a run and I saw some guy pointing his phone and I actually felt scared. I thought, is he taking a picture of me? Is he taking a video of me? You know, I, I don't, I, I think that that's not so far-fetched. I don't think I'm being paranoid. I mean, now that I know about this, I think about that now. And, and I think that that is, kind of in a sense a desired and result you know the kind of intent you know i mean what will happen if if we continue in this direction if this continues to progress the way it has been and so rapidly as well is that women will be afraid in public and yeah. even afraid to share pictures of themselves to make videos like we're doing now it, it will completely you know devastate our our sense of having a right to privacy and, and protection. Well, I, I actually, as a result of everything you were saying there, like I don't do any online social media at all. And I would advise people not to do online social media, use it strategically for political campaigning by all means. Uh, keep your photos on your hard drive, don't upload them to kind of servers, your private photos, and certainly don't disclose and share images. To think that, you know, it comes back to the underlying argument. Um, it's not the technology, it's the people's use, it's men's use of the technology that's harmful. Okay, some women do uh, cybercrime and other things, but the vast majority of it is men. And as we know with this, the vast majority of the depictions are of women being graphically subordinated and the men who are aroused by that subordination, they feel a sense of power. Just before I move on, I've just something that just occurred to me about the empathy, because um, it, it, in a book by Simon Baron Cohen, actually, he talks about zero degrees of empathy. I mean, he claims that, that it's part of the masculine makeup 
um, not to have empathy. Men have less empathy than women. That was their idea because apparently women are all empathizing and men are systematizing, making sense of the world by making connections uh, between abstract things. And um, the, the definition of empathy is if you, if you see someone who is experienced pain and suffering, you, the um, appropriate human response to pain and suffering is to feel distressed yourself. You know, you start to feel the distress of the person who is um, who is suffering. Now, in these pornographic videos, the women are in extreme distress. You know, sometimes they're crying. Of, of course, some of them are uh, smiling. I was actually reading something. Uh, when they used to have slaves in ancient Greece, in the uh, the women who own the prostitutes or the the in the prostitution uh, brothels, uh, they would put twigs inside their mouths so they always looked like they were smiling. So even if the women were being raped continually by the male slave owning citizens, um, they would have this like artifice that they put in the mouth so that the women always looked like they were smiling. And similar similarly. The women are obviously smiling in those images, but they're not, and they report this, they're not actually feeling happy when they're engaged in there. Uh, and they're often very numb to what they're experiencing because they might be taking multiple drugs, drugs to get through it. So this kind of idea that empathy, you can see someone suffering and in pain, and yet you can still be empathetic by continuing to act out a behavior towards them that might continue that pain is extraordinary, really. It's it's like a complete redefinition of empathy. It is. And, and that's an interesting point, because it almost seems as though, um, you know, I, I have kind of thought in the past, you know, pornography is the propaganda of patriarchy. And by that, I mean that it, it conditions men to not have empathy. I mean, you see that with um, the military, right? Militaries will often have brothels nearby or set up nearby. Um, what that does is it allows, it's not sexual. I mean, it is sexual, but it's not totally sexual. It's about power, right? So it allows him to get sort of a training on these women of dehumanization um, before he goes into war and has to do, you know, and has to kill people. Yeah, you have to dissociate, dehumanize. And I think that pornography is a tool for training people to dissociate. And I, again, want to tie that back into the gender ideology thing, because we are seeing in society a mass dissociation. This kind of dysphoria, I don't think really has so much to do with, with gender in it explicitly, but um, it, with the body explicitly and with the disconnection from the body, um, the disdain for the body, you know, being applauded as something that's somehow innate, as if we didn't, you know, get here through society, um, which I find astonishing. I mean, obviously, pornography can have that effect. We know that there's been research showing that it increases dissociation. Yeah, I think um, I think dissociation is the right uh, kind of word to describe what's going on. It's in fact, in my forthcoming book, I call it the politics of dissociation, but that's that's for later. But other people like Jennifer Bilek has talked about dissociation uh, recently. Uh, the last feminist ethical dialogues talked about the dissociation from the body. So this is a really powerful idea, dissociation. Let's talk about dissociation. What is it? Because maybe some people viewing this, maybe have never heard of it and they don't really understand what it means. So how can we help them to understand what the concept is? Well, as I understand it, dissociation is usually a trauma response where you feel disconnected from your body. Now, I don't actually think it's always got to be a trauma response. Like, for example, I have epilepsy. And so having seizures would later cause me to feel dissociated from my body in the sense that not having control over oneself can also uh, spur a feeling of helplessness or dissociation. But generally it's got to do with trauma, um, retreating from reality as a form of protection. 
for oneself as I understand it. So how about you? What do you think? So um, dissociation comes out of, this is where the intersections between radical feminism and psychotherapy have had, and has had a profound, uh, I would say a very important shift in how we think about mental health issues because the kind of biomedical model says there's something wrong with the person, there's a chemical imbalance in the human being. And uh, what we need to do is develop pharmacology or other uh, kind of to treat that, um, if you like, that biological body in this very specific way. Whereas dissociation is about your relationships with other people. You know, it comes from that, as you just said, the breakdown in relationships. Uh, often uh, it comes out of childhood trauma, childhood abuse. And, um, you know, I certainly think that if you think about the, the kind of experiences that young boys have, how they are forcibly disconnected from their emotions through patriarchal masculinist, uh, masculinity training that they receive right from the moment they're born, that they must disconnect from their emotions. Uh, emotions are threatening to them. The only ones that are allowed to display our aggression, that over time, <clears throat> when they become adults, you know, that then becomes a problem for how they ex their being in the world, you know, they're actually becoming then, well, first of all, they're not unable, they weren't treated as full human beings to begin with as children, like girls aren't treated as full human beings. And then they grow up into young men, and then they are exposed to pornography, which gives them an artificial sense of power, even if it's in their private little bedrooms, you see, they feel powerful over something. And the whole point about taking imagery of someone, even someone close to you or someone who's rejected you, is a power play. It's showing that, per, like, you use some examples. I mean, that's what people say. I'm going to show her, right? I'm going to show her that she can't treat me that way. And so they're using these resources in order to compensate for their their dissociation there, what they're lacking, what they're kind of lacking is a, a good, healthy, emotional development that is relational, um, empathetic. Um, so I would see dissociation like that. I would see it as a kind of fracturing of self into parts. Um, and depending on the kind of trauma and the, the need for power, of the of the man in questions some of the some of it will just at, be at the level of other people are abused i'll just get second you know i'll get uh, I'll, I'll get my power from viewing abuse images whereas some men go further than that and they want to actually torture um, other human beings for pleasure so it's a complete detachment from relationship, from empathy, from being with others. It's, um, yeah, it's a very, if it's not treated and someone has a huge amount of power and they're getting sexually aroused by their dissociation, then that is a very, I mean, this is, this is why we have all this stuff because men are getting sexually aroused by their mental health issues. Um, mm -hmm. But we'll come. We'll keep coming back to dissociation because, I, you know, I think what is important to me is that some of how our mental health narratives have always focused, particularly on populations with the least power, like women or or people of color, you know, have been overrepresented in the mental health system because anyone who spoke out of turn um, needed to be put back in their place and. Psychiatry was a very good strategic instrument for doing that. Whereas dissociation is not about that. Like a trauma, um, a kind of trauma uh, th therapeutic paradigm says if people are engaging in harmful behaviors in the world, there is probably some reason for it. And the reason for it is rooted in their own experiences and their relationships with others in their lives. 
Now, unfortunately, I think the trauma recovery can be as useful for men as, as it is for women who sometimes experience and receive it. Um, I don't know where you stand on this, but yeah, I, I think it's apps. I, you know, as radical feminists, either we believe that that kind of men can change, right? That these behaviors that they can stop watching porn, right? They can actually withdraw from it and stop watching it and try to seek help for the real problems they have in their lives. Or we just believe that um, this drive of men is so powerful that there's nothing we can do about it. And all we can do is, ever, is just keep um, trying to warn women, which is what you've done today very, very well, um, but also try and change the laws so at least there's criminal uh, prosecution for anybody who does move in this direction. Where do you sit on this? What, where, what do you think? I think that for me, the best approach is education and that I do think it is possible for men to change. Now, I know that there are people who would disagree with me about that, but I think about our options, right? So our, our options are to try to create change or to otherwise be on the defensive constantly. And, and that to me feels a little bit hopeless. Um, and I have in my life personally seen people change as well. So I not only believe that it can happen, I've seen it happen. The me too. will I've seen has to change. Yes. The will has to be there, of course, obviously, but you, you can instill that will in someone through education, I think. Yeah. And empathy. And we're not going to, if we, if we, if we kind of destroy the meaning of empathy um, to mean what you might be sexually aroused by and whether you're having a good time. Um, it was a very egocentric, you know, in the VR study, it was a very egocentric idea of empathy. Like it was how they were feeling. <laughs> um, exactly. And they, they only asked men. <laughs> yeah. I just keep coming back to that because it's like, well, I, I did think, I think I saw a couple of years ago, I did see a survey where they asked women what they thought about all of this. And of course the response from women was, you know, I, I don't like it. I'm against it. We, well, we see that again too, with things like the, um, the robots, you know, women don't tend to use them like men do. And, no. and then, as you said, there's that stereotype that, you know, uh, what did you say? Simon Baron Cohen talks about those stereotypes of masculinity and femininity while well, women are good at empathizing therefore but I mean that's a human trait isn't it <laughs> yeah of course it Not is just I mean it's to ridiculous women. I can't believe that his outlook had any traction in the world and there's plenty of people who have tried to uh, question it but it's a very powerful one because anything that kind of reinforces male power i.e male dominance gives men a sense in their own little tiny discrete universes, right? Because there might be just men alone at a computer with no interaction with other human beings, ne never mind having a partner or something. This is something, you know, this is what they're being sold. They're being sold a kind of big, they're being sold a politics of isolation and um, of, of, of fake, kind of power and status in the world. And then I guess the worrying thing is that everything we've just described here, well, you've described, more and more of us are getting immersed in these worlds, not even just men now, but you would find even younger generations of girls are being brought up on a diet of pornography from a very early age and wanting to mimic and you know, look like pornography. I mean, I'm surprised sometimes when you look at young women, how much they resemble pornographic, um, pornographic women, you know, the hair and the breasts and the shape and everything. So we're, that's having a huge impact on girls too. We will talk about girls, but let's get back to this. Um, so there is this idea 
Genevieve, that it's not the technology, it's, it's only the use of the technology. So is there any good, I mean, we did mention a bit about VR, could potentially have some positive applications, but what about deep fake? What is the, what is the potentially beneficial application of deep fakes? As far as I can see, not enough to justify continuing its existence. Um, the potential benefits have been things, you know, like for the Hollywood industry. Um, I think, again, they're really kind of scraping the bottom of the barrel to find a reason to continue with the technology. Like um, we could, we could, you know, do CGI effects or things like this. Um, I did see recently there was an interesting case in Japan where a man actually like depixelated pornography using this technology. So it was censored deliberately and he turned it into pornography. So I can't really see that the any benefit outweighs the, the threat to society. I mean, leaving apart the awful harms of deep fake pornography. The other aspect of it is that you can no longer trust your eyes anymore. Online. We won't That's know. Good. Yeah, online, yeah. you can't. Yeah, good, good point, yeah, exactly. But yeah, so any video could be fake. And then, you know, we've got this emerging technology alongside now that is the voice, the, the deep fake version of the voice now that you could simulate someone's voice and their speech patterns as well. You could entirely simulate a completely fake video. Um, I can't see anything that can justify that. Um, yeah. Maybe you do, I don't know. <laughs> well, I, I was, um, I, I don't think so because I think of all the, um, I think people need to spend less time online and more time with each other. And unless there's a good reason to go online, either, you know, to speak to a friend who's not in the same room as you or whatever, or to do work, um, I think so much entertainment takes place now for particularly young people online that they're being pulled into, they're being, you know, as far as I'm concerned, pornography is a politics. The politics, just like you said, is male domination and female subordination. It's graphic subordination. So what the politics does of this pornography and these applications does is it keeps perpetuating uh, misogyny, kind of male power, female subordination. Now, of the whole range, if you think about how things exist in the world, you know, people are probably developing... I mean, I think there is too, too, too many economic resources going into online things anywhere, not enough things taking place offline. Uh, so I would like to Kathleen, see, yeah, sorry. Sorry, I was just going to remind you about that announcement today about the metaverse. Oh yes, please, please talk about the metaverse. So, I mean, it's emerging right now, I mean, just today, Facebook announced the change to their company name. But from what I understand, this would potentially be, as it sounds like an online separate universe where you could even buy property, real estate, things like this, um, conduct work, meet with people. Just think of like how we're talking now on, on, on this platform but it would be, you know, like a universe instead and immersive with your headset. And uh, I actually tried VR once and it made me feel ill. <laughs> it yeah. made me feel like you, you viscerally feel that disconnect, you know, your, your body responds with a kind of confusion. I don't know, obviously I don't know the semantics of it, but it's got to do with your balance in your, in your ears and so on. Like, I wonder if that's also going to be a problem, you know, physical issues related yeah. with. Well, you'll be able to be in your metaverse sitting at home by yourself in your VR porn environments. 
you'll be able to buy the products from the corporations who you can, you can put on your penis or, um, you know, in your vagina or sensors you can put on your body. I mean, it's a really depressing future, isn't it? It's so depressing. It's like, um, yeah. It, uh, and it's like of all the things that we could do in the world, of all the ways that we can like work together to address problems. I mean, one of the biggest problems that exists now in the world is loneliness. Loneliness is the biggest problem. We have more human beings in the world than ever before in, in human time. And yet people feel this profound disconnect from each other. Like they can't, um, they don't feel understood. They're not good at making relationships. They can't deal with conflict. I mean, look what's going on at in universities, any kind of dissenting opinion or conflict. It's like um, they can't handle basic interactions between people because they haven't had the experience. They haven't built up the experiential um, you know, history with other human beings to be able to get to the point where they go, oh, I can be in this, I can be in a room with someone I disagree with. I can even be a bit angry and raise my voice. And I'm not going to die at the end of the day. You know, it's not going to have this severe knock-on effect. Um, and I just think, you know, it dissociation is a kind of mental health issue, but it's not just mental health as in the brain. It's it's kind of like it's a mal a maladapted response, isn't it? It's it's um it's a disorganized or distorted response to to being in the world and to living. So well I also think I think it kind of resembles a sort of hopelessness as well. I mean, it's a sense, it's kind of a giving up, you know, like if you, if you think about maybe like the fight or flight response, right. If you're, if you feel, if you sense a threat or a danger, the obviously the fight response would be on the defensive, but I feel like the dissociation is flight away from yourself. And I, and, and there's something profoundly, despairing and hopeless about that in my opinion it's quite sad like as you described the sinking into the um, online universe itself it it does seem as though there might be a lot of larger issues going on here as well you know we've got climate change why is everyone yes. denying that biology exists at the very time that biology is being decimated huh <laughs> like yes <laughs> honestly exactly yeah um i am um... You know, I, I think gender ideology and a lot of the a lot of these tech guys who are creating these technologies, and it is mostly men, all the women there as well, they're really into these ideologies. They're really into queer theory and gender ideology. And it's because all of them, if you like, give them it's like corporations don't need humanism, right? They don't need the enlightenment to be corporations. Corporations will attach to anything which enables them to maintain their position and control in the world, to maintain male supremacy and to maintain the property structure. And there's not one shift in the property structure between now and 6,000 years ago. It's, um, you know, there may have been some trickle down and some infrastructure built, but in fact, the pyramid shape, it's still a pyramid, but the people at the top of the pyramid are like, um using pronouns you know talking about uh uploading their consciousness into machines wanting to create this alternative universe in art in in property i would say in things that they can make money from you know they don't want to build cities in the world there's plenty of countries that could do with new cities right sanitation systems good electrical networks if you've ever been to La Paz in Bolivia, it's, you know, it's pretty, uh, it's, it kind of looks like people just made it up as they go along. You could, there's plenty of cities, plenty of space in the world where you could create these cities, but they want everyone to go online. They want us all to be alone at our computers. And yeah, gender ideology and queer theory and porno. That's why I think pornography is the politics that's driving it. Male supremacy, 
just reproduced over and over again through these technologies. Um, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's uh, it just was revisiting Andrea Long Chu today um, because he's just been named a book critic for New York Magazine. But yeah, back to his quote where he says that pornography is the quintessential expression of femaleness. I mean, how, how is it surprising to anybody that we, we've come into an era of streaming violent pornography and the response has shifted to be, well, women are pornography, women are sex acts, that's what they're for. What, why is that surprising? I, I mean, obviously that's going to be the logical outcome of people who are raised on that kind of media. Um, I, I keep bringing that up because I really wanna hammer that home with, with people who are critical of gender ideology because um, this is really the fight for our humanity that's at stake here. We we get told to be kind. Some people might believe that being kind is a, a decent and respectable approach, but I think we really need to start getting angry and we need to harness our anger and utilize it correctly and utilize it to, to a degree where it can cause constructive change. Yeah, absolutely. And um, well, I could go on and on and on, but I, I've gone over my hour rule. Um, it's not my rule, it's the internet. Uh, so why don't we, why don't we think about a topic for our next one, maybe the metaverse, that might be, um, so thinking about these mixed realities. So I guess the Pokemon Go was a good example where you could have, you could have this experience of things being in two places at the same time. And um, yeah, and, and then let's keep talking about dissociation and this politics that is now ubiquitous. And I guess for me, you know, and I, and people know this about me, anyone who knows me personally, I've said it in lots of meetings. I used to watch pornography, right? I used to, I joined a left-wing organization when I was 15 years old, who said that pornography was free speech and that actually it was part of my, uh, my power as a woman to watch other women being graphically subordinated. It wasn't until uh, a kind of, you know, a reassessment of my own life and really thinking how horrific pornography is. You know, it was like a, I had a political awakening through radical feminism that enabled me and I had some different relationships in my life because if your life is full of people who watch pornography, no one's gonna question anything you do. No one's gonna raise, you're not even gonna, you're not even gonna think there's anything wrong because you're not even in an environment where anyone's asking you any questions about your practices. So uh, as a result of this, I learned about radical feminist approach to pornography. And I tell you, it is accurate. Everything they said in pornography and civil rights is pornography. Um, and the fact that a left-wing organization was the one that really groomed me into pornography as a young woman, I will never forgive the left for that. And th this is where we're at. The rejection of pornography is gonna be uh, where political consciousness develops now. It's going to be the reaction against pornography. And I want women to react against pornography, but I also want men to react against it too, because if we're going to be in relationship with each other, we're going to build these communities outside of these corporate interests. You know, we've got to, we've got to do it to together. Men, men can't, women can't. I know there are some arguments for a separatism, but I just don't think it's feasible if you want to bring about real change. So I'm going to have, hand over yeah. the last word to you. I want you to, if there's anything I didn't cover that you think, oh, I, I mean, there's so much in your um, presentations that I'm sorry if I didn't get to all of the different content, but is there anything you'd like to like remind us of from the presentations? Um. I guess I keep thinking about the fact that the very concept of woman itself is now something that's being turned into a commodity 
And I don't think it's a coincidence that it's happening alongside this phenomenon. I don't think gender ideology is a coincidence happening alongside this. I think they're fundamentally linked. And I think that we really need to reject both, um, but we also need to be aware that they are linked, that for example, the gender movement is not a human rights movement, that it's a movement to take away women's rights and that it is seeking to define women as pornography. I have seen some truly degrading, disgusting things posted by men who claim to identify as women, things I don't even wanna repeat. And knowing that that's how they view us as pornography makes me wish that I could show everyone, but I can't because I don't want people to see some of the things that I've seen. So I want people to know that that's what we're up against and we need to start getting really serious about it and perhaps maybe not worry so much about infighting or things like that, which really conflict our ability to, to challenge this. Huge, I think this is the biggest, maybe the biggest challenge for women um, in, in modern history. And I think we need to start treating it as such. Yeah, and I agree. And on that note, thank you very much for today. And uh, I will post it online very soon. And yes, join us for our next Feminist Ethical Dialogues. Thank you, Genevieve. Bye for now. Thank you.